Oh, whoops. I don't need this right now. There we go. Well, we're finally doing it. We're talking about a Shin Megami Tensei game after receiving God knows how many requests for it. Ever since I finished the Persona reviews, I've had so many people asking me when am I going to do the SMT series, and I'm just never sure. I didn't even get into Persona until a few years ago when 5 came out. However, thanks to the recent re-release of the third mainline entry for modern consoles, I can now dip my toes into the pool of Shin Megami Tensei games, hoping this will be the kick I need to give the series a chance, similar to how Persona 5 convinced me to try out the other games games for that series. As a lot of you know though, Persona used to be the spawn of Shin Megami Tensei before that series got so popular and became its own thing, mostly thanks to Persona 4 Golden by 2012. Thus, even to this day, a majority of the SMT fanbase are venting their frustration onto Persona fans, using every insult and every language to make them as much of an unwelcoming community as they possibly can, usually calling them weebs or telling them to play a real Shun Megumi Tensei game. In turn, the Persona fans get annoyed with the way SMT fans are acting and get their aggression out, calling them edgelords for liking the darker tones in the games and how they're just hipsters who are jealous that their series of games isn't as popular, it's all a complete mess. I know not absolutely everyone in either fanbase behaves this way, but it unfortunately takes up a large amount of internet discussions about both franchises. That's partly why I've been holding off doing Shin Megami Tensei reviews in the first place. It's a bit of a gamble when Persona fans talk to SMT fans or SMT fans talk to Persona fans. You might get someone that's perfectly civil with you and can hold a friend conversation, or you may end up in a huge-ass flame war with no resolution. Hell, sometimes that happens even when fans of the same series talk to each other. We've got SMT5 coming later this year at least, so hopefully that'll clear things up a little. Uh, who am I kidding? This feud's never gonna die down. It's all very depressing, but let's go over SMT Nocturne anyway. The Shin Megami Tensei series began in 1992, created by Atlas, with the first game released on the Super Famicom. Though if you want to go back further, there was also Digital Devil's Story Megami Tensei in 1987 for PCs and the Famicom. These games and a few of the subsequent entries to this day are all Japanese exclusives, aside from an iOS version of Shin Megami Tensei 1 that, as far as I know, even that's not available anymore. Nocturne, the third mainline game in the series, was the first one to arrive outside of Japan in 2004 for the US and 2005 for Europe on the PlayStation 2, with the HD remaster arriving around a month and a half ago at this time. The European version calls it SMT Lucifer's Call, which makes sense in context with the game, as we'll see, but I'm fine with Nocturne either way. I suppose since this was the first game in the series we received, I can somewhat get away with reviewing Nocturne before the previous SMTs. It might still be cheating, but eh. As likely expected, I'm going to be using the HD remaster for this video, specifically the PS4 version being run on the PS5. Oh yeah, I finally snagged one of those giant pieces of smush licorice. And the first thing we're looking at on it is a PS4 remaster of an early 2000s PS2 game. Really taking advantage of its capabilities, aren't we? Unfortunately, as a lot of people have pointed out already, no matter which version of the remaster you have, this isn't exactly a flawless port. It's a PS2 game with a bumped up resolution, however the frame rate is still in 30 frames per second even on PCs. Maybe boosting it to 60 would have affected the RNG of the game, though it kinda sucks that Atlas did such a good job with the PC port of Persona 4 Golden, but they couldn't do the same with Nocturne. I don't know what happened here as well, but this port frequently has moments where for a split second there's this giant black streak that shows up whenever it feels like it, and it's so distracting. I haven't played it for myself as of yet, but apparently the Switch version manages to be even worse, sometimes dipping the frame rate into single digits. Which given that this is only a remaster and the Switch has ran older PS2 games very well in the past, that's inexcusable. The heavily compressed music that was in the original release has also not been changed in the HD version. This is what it's supposed to sound like. And this is what it actually sounds like. Not all of the tracks suffer that, and I can understand if maybe it's not possible to grab the source files anymore and fix the ones that do, but was it really so difficult to just use audio from a much better quality YouTube video that's been around for years and stick it into the game that way? The music as is, while good, sounds so awful with this compression, and I don't understand why Atlas were lazy about this when they've proven time and time again through the likes of Catherine Full Body, Persona 4 Golden, and Persona 5 Royal that they don't generally re-release their games with 
without some upgrades or new content. In fact, they even gave the original version of Nocturne the same treatment back in the day with the Maniacs edition. Basically a director's cut with restored content and featuring Dante from the Devil May Cry series. Haha, <laughs> yes, I said the thing. We'll get to him later. The Maniacs edition was the copy that everybody outside of Japan already had, and it's what the HD version is based on, while also including voice acting during cutscenes, which the original didn't have whatsoever. Although Dante's now been reduced to paid DLC. I imagine there were probably some copyright issues between Atlas and Capcom, so I guess it makes sense as to why you have to purchase him now. And hey, it's pretty awesome to see the man himself, Ruben Langdon, voicing him again. My name's Dante. I'm a devil hunter, meaning I massacre guys like you. Right, so there's actually a minimal amount of story in Nocturne compared to what we've seen in the Persona games, meaning I'm not going to make an extended thoughts video after this like what I normally do with Persona. I don't think it'd be worth it in this case, but I'll provide a time code here for you if you want to avoid spoilers anyway. If you're still here, then let's take a dive into our very first Shin Megami Tensei narrative. The game begins with a woman telling us that the world will pay for its sins, needing to die in order for it to be reborn into something greater. That's one hell of a start. And it turns out this crazy lady is our teacher, Miss Yuko Takao. She tells us that she doesn't want us to suffer the same fate, so she wishes to bring us into this new world. Us being the protagonist that you can name whatever you want, as well as the other main characters. But canonically, our hero is known as Naoki Kashima. Just like Persona 1 and 2, we also need to give our protagonist a nickname. He'll later be known as the Demi-Fiend, which is what you normally put in. But at the very first glimpse I got of the guy, I knew he wasn't going to have any character whatsoever, so he doesn't deserve a canonical name in my opinion. Following my Persona 1 video, I'm going to call you Tats Boy instead of Mute Boy. Yeah, my imagination's very wild, isn't it? Seriously though, I didn't think you could somehow get even less personality than Naoya Toto, but Tats Boy managed to find a way. I'm not even exaggerating, he doesn't react to a single thing that happens in this game, only letting the player decide what he says to affect the ending. He stands there with that exact same expression throughout the entire story, and it is so very flat. Cool character design, but he's as stock of a silent protagonist as it comes. Hell, most silent protagonists at the very least can look surprised or raise a smirk. Anyway, after that opening scene goes straight to the point, we find our protagonist coming out of a train station as his friend Isamu informs him that he's supposed to be meeting Mr. Kao in the hospital for a special visit. I imagine he already knows that if we just took a train over here. It's almost as if they needed some way to inform the players. We're told to go to Yoyogi Park to meet with him and their other friend Chiaki, but we see that the park's been closed off. Nearby is a fellow named Tajiri who explains to us that the park may have been closed due to a struggle between two cults, leading to several deaths. Tatsboy's cell phone then goes off and we're greeted by an annoyed Chiaki who says that she and Isamu left to the hospital already because we didn't show. I literally just got here, you couldn't wait a couple more minutes? Hijiri then reveals himself to be the author of an occult magazine that talks about something strange going on at the hospital Mr. Takao's at. We make it to the hospital afterwards to find it completely deserted aside from Chiaki, who takes the magazine from us and starts to read it. After some searching around, we also find Isamu wandering the hospital, still having trouble finding out where their teacher is. Once we make it back to Chiaki, she discovers in the magazine that there's a group of demon worshippers right in Japan known as the Ring of Gaia, who believe in a book of prophecy called the Scripture of Moroku, which says that chaos will engulf the world. Well, somebody informed Jack from Stranger of Paradise. The hospital our leads are currently in is said to be connected to the Ring of Gaia's plan, and that might not be too far off, because not only does there appear to be a satanic ritual being being held in one of the hospital rooms, but upon exploring the hospital further, we come across one of the main antagonists, Hikawa. A man that looks like he's in a gritty reboot of the Smurfs thanks to the lighting in this room, but he brings up the scripture of Moroku we talked about earlier, as well as how the world needs a redo, and that Tats Boy's not among his group of followers that survived the brawl at Yoyogi Park. Hikawa basically straight out admits that he's playing a part in all of the aforementioned chaos that's arriving soon. Believing that Tats Boy's seen too much, Hikawa just comes out with it and tries to kill him, wearing the most adorable little bracelet his daughter made him. But Miss Takao shows up in the nick of time to put a stop to it. She seems to be in cahoots with Hikawa, claiming to end their partnership if he doesn't let Tats Boy live, and she orders us to meet her on the hospital's roof where she'll explain everything. On our way there, we randomly stumble upon an old woman and her young master who seem interested in our hero for some reason 
reason, but there are more important matters right now as we catch up to Mr. Cow. In a massive bombshell less than half an hour into the game, she tells us that the world's about to end soon and everyone outside of this hospital will perish. This process is referred to as the conception, allowing for a new world to be created, with Takao believing herself to be some kind of maiden for this reborn world, wanting to provide a better way to live. Soon enough, the conception actually does start happening and the entire world is completely destroyed, wiping out the whole of humanity, aside from the main characters. Immediately after that, the old woman and child return to further shit on the protagonist and take away some of his human form with this thing called a Magatama, which gives us demonic powers, though I'm pretty sure it's that bug whatchamacallit that tracks Neo in the Matrix. Tat's boy then becomes the Demi-Fiend as we pose for the trailer. A half-human, half-demon hybrid, and we end up back at the hospital's basement as we encounter Hijiri again, who's going to help by studying as much as he can about this new world called the Vortex World, while we take care of any demons that now take up most of the inhabitants. As we finally leave the hospital, the old woman and child appear once again to point us to the creator of the Vortex World, Kagutsuchi, who's currently leaving things the way they are until someone provides what's referred to as a reason, beliefs for how the Vortex world should be formed. Everyone has a reason of their own, whether the world should be remade to help others, or as a way of obtaining more power and order, which is what Hikawa and his assembly of Nihilo are trying to do, while their rivals, the Mantra Army, have more of a might-makes-right kind of reason. These guys are more like common thugs committing petty crimes compared to Hikawa trying to take over the world, so at one point, after going through some trials, you can form a truce with the Mantra and join them in taking down Hikawa. Meanwhile, you've also got the mannequins spread throughout this distorted Tokyo. And while they certainly look human, they're more like hollow shells with frequent spasms, some of them even becoming slaves to the demons. And you'll later meet one of their crazier ones named Sakahagi who skins his fellow mannequins for their Magatsui. Magatsui being demonic energy that surrounds all of the creatures in the Vortex world, including the Demi-Fiend. The more Magatsui you have, the stronger you become. Although the mannequins have a reason of their own, as told by their leader Futomimi when you eventually meet him. Simply Simply wanting to build a utopia for the mannequins to live in peace. Thwarting Hikawa's plan is one of the ultimate goals in Nocturne, but we need to search for our friends alongside that. Chiaki is found not too long after the conception, looking and acting entirely defeated, while Isamu gets discovered as you enter the Mantra headquarters for the first time. He seems to be handling the situation a little better than Chiaki, but neither of them seem to be adjusting well to the Vortex world. It gets so bad that they very quickly decide to take it upon themselves and merge with false gods that come from the Shadow Vortex, a world full of timelines where the conception didn't happen, thus transporting to other worlds that are suffering from the conception, hoping to gather more Magatsui there. You taking notes on this? Grab a pen and paper, there's a quiz afterwards. But yeah, where the hell did this sudden change in character come from between Chiaki and Isamu? I mean, granted, we didn't get to know them too well before the conception occurred, but I didn't get the impression that they give up so fast that they think joining forces with almighty deities and fulfilling their own reasons was the way to go. At least with Chiaki, when you first meet her after the conception, she shows signs of deep depression and has absolutely no clue what to do with her life anymore. So you kind of get the idea that it's all hitting her pretty hard hard and snapping her out of it is a lost cause, but Isamu? When you see him after the world ends, it doesn't seem like he's changed too much. He's a little less cocky than before, but it's complete mood whiplash to see him be like, whoa, dude, what's going on here? And a couple interactions later, he's like, I want to kill every living being in existence. Isamu's reason is to create a paradise for everyone where there are no people around to get in the way, leaving you to do whatever you want, achieving this by sacrificing Hajiri who we captured earlier, in order to awaken his own entity to combine with Noah. Even Hajiri just before this seemed to have his own agenda by using the Demi-Fiend to get what he wants, and that with all of the knowledge he's obtained about the Vortex world, he should be the one to remake the new world. Jesus, we're just getting backstabbed left and right in this game. Once you explore deep enough inside the optional dungeon, the Labyrinth of Amala, you find out through a lady in black and the old man she's caring for, looking an awful lot like the child from the beginning of the game, that Hajiri is actually a reincarnated mannequin after his human form passed away from the conception. This was done as a curse for committing a sin that never really gets explained, believing that he survived the conception, having no memory of his sin or being cursed to begin with. It's pretty tragic once you learn about it, but I wish those details weren't so easy to miss by not doing the Labyrinth of Amala, and even then I would have liked to know what his sin was. Chiaki's reason is a little more primitive in that she only wishes to live in a world where the strong survive and dispose of the weak. Using the leader of the mantra to splice his abilities with her body and the rest of the mantra follow her stead. 
Once that's done, Chiaki then fuses herself with another god, becoming Ball Avatar. That's a whole lot of Magatsui she's got inside of her at this point, which is very bad news. Her morals are shown in one of Nocturne's more gruesome moments where Chiaki commits mass genocide against a large group of mannequins in their hometown, along with Futomimi if you decide to go against her ideals. Though you can still fuse Futomimi and put him in your party when able to. Hikawa's reason is to create a world where individuality is completely removed. Everyone is one and the same and abides by the same rules, melding with the god Ariman to maintain his image and power as ruler. Finally, there's Miss Takao's reason who merely wants humanity to feel free and live life to the fullest. Takao does form with her own deity at one point named Aradia, but she's never truly evil in this game and was tricked by Hikawa, because yeah, that's a guy you can definitely trust. Takao comes to realize that was a jackass move anyway, and after defeating Hikawa's elite demon near the end of the game, she starts to fade away, for some reason. She's not being attacked or anything, it just kinda happens. But she gives the Demi-Fiend an artifact that will bring Kagatsushi straight down to him so we can take him on in a final battle. As we traverse Kagatsuchi's pain-in-the-ass tower for what feels like an eternity, we finish off Ikawa, Isamu, and Chiaki along the way, before reaching the Omnipotent One himself, who surprisingly wasn't that hard to beat. And oh, okay, we got like six different endings to get through here. Each of them can be obtained by simply agreeing with most or all of a character's statements for their reasons, which I didn't think to do in my first run, and I don't feel like going through the whole game again just to record them myself, so I thank the wonderful world of YouTube for letting me see them that way. First up, we have the demon ending if you decide not to support anybody's reasons, and not help Aradia when she asks for your cooperation around two-thirds into the game. Here, Kagutsuchi scolds you for your indecisiveness and says he'll wait until the next conception for someone else to reshape the world. The blonde child from the start of the game gives you his blessing despite that, but still goes away somewhere else. Next is the Yosuga ending if you choose to go with Chiaki's reason. She simply congratulates you on succeeding, and Tat's boy becomes his normal self again as he's presented his new survival of the fittest world, and Chiaki disappears for being one of the weaklings she vowed to destroy. Then there's the Masubi ending if you decide to follow Isamu's reason, where once again, Tat's boy regains his human form and Isamu is nowhere to be seen apart from his hat and a tombstone commending your efforts, signifying that they're both alone in the world now. The Shijima ending is unlocked if you agree with Akawa's reason, as the two of you begin your new lives living in perfect harmony with no conflict to break it up. Second to last is the freedom ending if you again don't support any reasons, but still assist Aradia. This one has you restore the world to its original state before the conception as part of Mr. Cow's final request. With everyone alive and well having no memory of anything that happened, moving on with their lives much to Kagutsuchi's displeasure. Where the future lies is up to them. The last of the available endings, which is the one I went for, is the true demon ending that you get for simply completing the Labyrinth of Amala before entering Kagatsushi's tower, cancelling all of the other endings no matter which reason you went with. And I believe this one was added for the Maniacs edition as well. Defeating Kagatsuchi has officially stopped time itself, meaning death and rebirth is no longer possible and the universe is in shambles. The child and the old man, both revealed to be Lucifer, provide one final test to the Demi-Fiend by battling the Dark Lord himself to see if he's capable of facing against something called the Great Will. Based on what I've seen from the Megami Tensei wiki, the Great Will is a reoccurring entity within the series that in Nocturne's case is supposed to be even more powerful than Kagatsuchi. The fight against Lucifer is definitely way tougher than the Kagatsuchi boss. He resists almost everything and has a lot of painful attacks, particularly as his large amount of health gets lower and lower. My advice is to equip the Frey Kugel skill from the Kailash Magatama you can purchase in Kagatsuchi's tower, along with the skill Pierce to cut through Lucifer's resistance. A charged up attack is the best way of damaging him for sure, and also bring a healer as well as a number of MP recovery items. If you can, get the Masakado's Magatama too by collecting the other ones and clearing the mini dungeon that unlocks. You'll withstand most attacks while you have it on. If you eventually win, Lucifer praises you for a wonderful battle and he's fully confident the Demi-Fiend will lead them to victory. We march forward with our new demon army in this one hell of a badass final shot, and then the game fades to black before we can find out what happens in this epic battle against the Great Will or how the world's going to end up. Bit of a cop-out, honestly, since I'm not sure if this story actually continues in another game, but I ain't gonna lose sleep on it if it doesn't. Okay, so that was my first time going through a Shin Megami Tensei story, and what do I think of it? Yeah, it's good. I don't think I would definitely call this my favorite story in the Mega Ten games, which, by the way, thank you guys for pointing out in the Persona 1 video that Mega Ten actually covers both SMT and Persona instead of strictly SMT. 
Nocturne's narrative is pretty minimalistic for an RPG, there isn't much character development, and a portion of the cutscenes that progress the story are split somewhat far apart from each other. The battles are what's going to take up most of your time while playing, which can be fun, but I certainly would have liked more of a break in between just to sit back and watch the story unfold. But we unfortunately only get a serviceable amount of those moments. It is cool that we do get to pick the reason we wish to follow for multiple endings, encouraging replayability. Though I wish we actually got to learn a bit more about the characters, characters before coming to a decision. You only sort of get a general idea of what they're going through, and it's mostly after the conception has already happened. Sometimes it does work to a degree, like with Miss Takao feeling guilty about being manipulated by Hikawa, convincing herself that unleashing the conception was the right thing to do, and then helping the Demi-Fiend in any way she can to fix her mistake. I also felt very bad for Futomimi, despite him not getting very many scenes. He just wants his people to be free from the demon's shackles and does his best to protect his brethren. But not only do they end up getting slaughtered during Chiaki's rampage, choosing to assist Chiaki puts you in a fight against Futomimi himself, and that's heartbreaking. But then you've got characters like Hikawa, who's kind of a generic antagonist in my opinion. He's the soft-spoken business type, talking more like a salesman trying to convince you to join his cult and buy his book, so you can fulfill his reason with him. Hikawa's dialogue's a little uninteresting on top of that, and his personality all around is pretty boring. I think the worst offenders, though, have to be Chiaki and Isamu. We know very little about these two before the conception begins, and there are only a couple of other scenes with them after shit hits the fan before they instantaneously turn evil. I understand that this is a grim reality they have to adapt to, but having such an immediate character change in that they want to kill anybody weaker than they are, or isolate themselves from the rest of the world, feels way too rushed in my eyes with this 40-plus hour game. Just a reminder, I still think the story is decent enough overall with some good ideas, but I felt as if it could have been expanded a bit further. I've definitely talked about it for long enough anyway, so why don't we discuss the gameplay? Can I recommend this as a game for newcomers to Mega Ten? Honestly, probably not, but that's only because Nocturne front loads you with a lot of stuff, most of which you'll sort of have to figure out on your own. Luckily, because I played every single Persona game beforehand, I came to grips with Nocturne fairly quickly, and I think anybody coming from Persona can adjust to it as well. But there are some things about the gameplay that makes SMT3 a different beast. Nocturne's one of the pioneers for what's known as the press turn system. This is where the game follows normal RPG rules by having every one of your party members perform their actions before the enemy gets a turn, indicated by these icons on the top right of the screen, going down by one for every member, your party mainly consisting of yourself and personas, uh, I mean demons. However, you can extend the amount of turns you have by inflicting weaknesses on enemies or getting critical hits, which I'm sure by now we're no stranger to, but you could potentially keep this going until every one of your party members gets an extra turn, totaling up to 8 moves you can make. The downside is that if you miss your attacks or an enemy blocks it, that'll cost 2 of your turns, and even worse if your attack gets absorbed or reflected, that reduces all of your turns. The same principle applies to the enemies and bosses though, so depending on what demons you have in your party, it's possible to turn turn the tables on them. You'll also want to take advantage of the pass feature if you don't want a particular party member to act, since that costs only half a turn, allowing you to either spend another half turn performing an action, or passing on to the next party member. To actually acquire demons for your party, just like in Persona 1 and 2, you'll need to have a silver tongue and be able to talk to them by catering towards their feelings and desires. Annoyingly, you have to kill the other enemies to even speak to the one you actually want, because you'll be told to back off otherwise, and while negotiations are definitely more simple than in Persona 1 and 2, only having one dialogue option with some demons having other conversational skills to tide enemies over to you, some enemies can still be really stubborn. They'll usually ask for a lot of maka, this game's currency, or some some healing item in your inventory, which most of the time it's lifestones that are very plentiful, but other times they want chakra drops that restore SP and are not nearly as plentiful. Even after all that though, that might still not be enough and you'll have to try again next time and oh, uh, does it make me mad when that happens. I think it might have something to do with the Kagutsuchi, this moon dial on the top left of the screen. After a certain amount of steps, the dial will change and affect multiple things, like how the enemies behave during battles, how often you can escape them, and I believe the mystical chest you find as well, but I'm not sure. There are even skills that work best when the Kagutsuchi's at a specific phase. And quick tip for if you do the Angyo Ki fight, face him during a full Kagutsuchi. That's the only way you'll be able to see his shadow and tell him apart from his clones, which as far as I know, the game doesn't tell you about. Back to recruiting demons anyway, they'll also learn more abilities as they level up, and after obtaining all of them, some will get to evolve into a new demon on top of that. 
Changing demons frequently is the name of the game though, as is tradition with Mega Ten titles in general. Aside from negotiating, you may also need to sacrifice two of your demons in the Cathedral of Shadows found in fixed spots, usually next to a major save point that can be used for fast travel, as opposed to the minor ones that are mainly there to save your game. When two demons are offered, they'll be fused into a new one with transferred skills that luckily in the HD remaster you can pick manually, unlike the original version where it was all randomized every time you step out of the menus and come back in. There are still fusion failures that can occur, ending up with a much different demon than you anticipated, but I've only had it happen once throughout my entire playthrough. I would say overall anyway that Nocturne has a very interesting battle system, and it can be quite fun once you learn how everything works, but we've only discussed part of the package, as there's the various Magatamas you can pick up throughout the game too. By themselves, they each give you temporary stat boosts upon equipping them, along with new resistances and weaknesses, but they also contain new skills that you can decide whether or not to permanently attach to the Demi Fiend after leveling up enough. You can simply buy a good chunk of Magatama in a number of stores you come across, but some of them will require going out of your way to search for them, like returning to Kabukicho Prison to fight Black Frost, or completing this game of Puzzle Boy that I swear to god is harder than the actual fighting. Oh, it looks like a basic enough puzzle mini game, and it is in concept, but I got stuck on these stages for almost two hours because of how complicated the puzzles can be. I finished 11 of the stages on my own, but then I found out there's 20 of them you have to finish in a row without saving. I look at what I have to deal with and then say, screw it, I'm checking a guide. It's one in the goddamn morning, I'm already burned out and in annoyed from the Ikibukuro tunnel section beforehand, and I don't have time to sit here for hours figuring out what to do by myself without saving. I don't feel guilty about this at all. Where was I? Oh yeah, leveling up. Again, like in Persona 1 and 2, going up a new level lets you choose which stat you'd like to increase by one, but unless you grind to hell and back, you're not going to be able to max out every one of your stats by the end of the game, so you'll have to settle on going for a more physical build, a more magical build, or somewhere in between. I personally made sure to make my magic somewhat decent, but I put a little more effort into my physical attacks overall. Dungeons and Nocturne can be pretty huge, and there's only so much MP you can spare, so in a lot of my playthrough, I just turned auto battle on as my team rushed in and continuously beat the crap out of enemies, which got me okay results, but it does make things a little boring after a while. This got further implemented after I obtained the focus skill that uses up a turn to charge your next physical attack. I never got rid of it once it was learned because I had so much use for it, especially against the bosses. Something else that does happen though after leveling up is that most of the time the Magatsui, or demon energy surrounding the Demi Fiend, will have a reaction, and you can choose if you want to follow through with it or not. It could either fully heal yourself or even the whole party on the rare occasion, but other times you may suffer from a status ailment, or worse, you'll end up cursed, and trust me, you do not want to get cursed in this game. The Demi Fiend's actions become completely unpredictable by that point. Sometimes he'll do what you tell him to, and other times he won't, possibly even hurting your other party members. The only way to get rid of this is by visiting the Fountain of Life spread throughout Tokyo. You especially don't want to get cursed during a particularly large dungeon. The previous Shin Megami Tenseis usually have you view them from a first-person perspective, but Nocturne uses a third-person perspective, which personally I think works better in RPGs anyway. Although you can switch the camera to a first-person view with a more grid-like control scheme if you prefer your dungeon crawlers to play like that. However, without it, you don't get to see the cool details on the Demi Fiend, like his tattoos lighting up in a dark area, or turning red when he's low on health and limping. That's pretty neat. Although I really hated the tunnel sections in this game if my Puzzle Boy rant didn't already make that clear. Clear. You have to keep buying light balls to temporarily see where you're even going, and occasionally they'll throw hazardous floors, which means you'll need to buy plenty of float balls to hover over them. I know certain demons have skills to combat that, but they're sadly not too common. I don't have much of a problem with the dungeons, despite not being absolutely amazing in my opinion, but they each have a gimmick of sorts to prevent the experience from becoming too stale. This ranges from using mirrors to flip the Kabukicho prison upside down, a horde of pixies teleporting you all over the place, or my personal favorite, the Dia building, where you need to figure out if the path you're heading is a forced perspective or not. I'm a sucker for illusions like that, they can be quite clever, especially the 3D art you find in museums. The ultimate test is the Labyrinth of Amala though, an optional dungeon that can only be progressed by winning against the fiends you find in very specific locations. There's five so-called Kalpas to tackle, each with their own set of challenges, and maybe a powerful boss at the end. Seriously, this one against Beelzebub is brutal and it goes on forever too. 
The Kalpas will take a while to finish, and there are no save points outside of the entrance, but luckily you don't have to do all of the Kalpas in one go, since there are teleporters that lead to different ones, and completing every single Kalpa is necessary to earn the true ending, as well as severely upgrade your starting Pixie to have amazing stats and skills. It's pretty funny to see a basic-ass Pixie battling someone as almighty as Metatron. This is also where we encounter Dante again, after only meeting him once throughout the entire story, engaging in a sudden boss fight, and then gets sidelined to the Labyrinth of Amala afterwards. How dare you do that to my boy? If you don't have the Maniacs pack, then Dante will instead be replaced by Raido Kuzunoha from the Devil Summoner games, another SMT subseries. Never played them myself as of now, but hopefully the fans it does have will appreciate the cameo. I don't know what's with the talking cat that's voiced by Noctis from Final Fantasy XV, but Raido himself looks kind of cool. Though, come on, why would you choose him over Dante? It's goddamn Dante from Devil May Cry in Mega Ten, and he doesn't feel out of place at all. I really respect him bringing some light heart in this to this depressing as hell game too. A little weird to see Ruben Langdon voicing Dante over his Devil May Cry 2 model, but eh, who cares, I love that design. They even call back to Devil May Cry 2 by showing Dante's coin with heads on each side. Nice reference but please don't remind me of Devil May Cry 2. Though, oh man, you should have seen my face when I discovered you could have Dante in your party. I was instantly determined to slog my way through the Labyrinth of Amala just to recruit him, including that one time where he was chasing me around and shooting at me like Nemesis from Resident Evil 3. It took an excruciating amount of time, and you really have to jump through some hoops to unlock him. You need to talk to this guy in the fourth Kalpa, then go all the way back to the second and talk to this guy, something the game doesn't make very clear, by the way. The same goes for when you need to meet Loki afterwards back in Nyx's lounge. No, not that Nyx, she's way more hot here. Who then tells you to talk to this one mannequin with a key to access this one door in the fourth Kalpa. So you need to make your way back, enter the fifth Kalpa, and then you meet with Dante again. A huge pain in the ass to do, but it was so worth it. Dante is really damn strong. He's got his trusty rebellion for hard-hitting sword combos, Ebony and Ivory return to pump more demons full of lead, Two some time is one of my favorite skills in the game personally. He can taunt enemies again to greatly lower their defense but raise their attack power, and he can remove debuffs for a small amount of MP. Dante is a great party member to have. I can only assume Raido has the exact same abilities, just under a different name. So Dante, I guess, is more of an aesthetic change, but he's still too damn cool. I've been holding this off long enough, so I suppose we should mention Nocturne's dreaded difficulty. This is frequently considered across the internet as one of the hardest games in the series, kicking your ass left and right and maybe kill your dog in the process. But I don't necessarily agree with that. True, Nocturne does have its difficult moments, particularly with some of the bosses, but I actually didn't lose that often throughout my playtime. Like I said earlier, I didn't have much trouble rushing through the enemies, in combination with my party stats and the enemies missing their attacks just enough for me to get away with it. Certain enemy formations did require a little more focus from me, but most of any struggles I had came from the bosses, and even then I wouldn't say they were insanely hard. Not even the notorious Mott in the Diet Building. Though granted, he did get severely nerfed in the HD remaster. In the original PS2 version of Nocturne, there's a chance that Mott will keep spamming Dragon's Eye to give himself more turns, thus allowing himself to keep using deadly spells to wipe out your party in no time flat. I don't think I even need to imagine that was not fun or fair at all. All of Nocturne's bosses have a tendency to provide more turns for themselves, but Mott just took it way too far. Thankfully, the HD remaster completely tones that down, and Mott's no longer a cheating, spoiled brat that you always have to let win. I beat him on my first try, if that's any indication. Anyway, back to the difficulty, part of why I don't feel this game's all that hard is due to the fact that Nocturne, and from what I understand the Shin Megami Tensei series in general, are built around the idea that buffs and debuffs are vital to success. You try facing against a boss with no buffs whatsoever, you're not gonna have a good time. Put any of them on the Demi Fiend or fuse a demon with at least one or two and you'll be good is gold. Nowhere is this further emphasized than with the infamous Matador battle around five hours into the game. As soon as you start, he casts an evasion buff on himself that has four times the potency, making him nearly impossible to hit and avoid. So you end up going nowhere in this fight, but this is Nocturne's way of teaching you to use your own buffs and debuffs against him, which not only covers the entire party straight away, unlike Persona, but they also can stack up to four times to increase their effectiveness. And suddenly you might actually stand a chance of beating Matador. I had a few people criticize me in the Eternal Punishment video for not knowing to use buffs sooner when I mentioned how one boss fight near the end of the game basically required it, since he restores over 700 HP after every turn. I've mentioned countless times in my Persona videos I've never played SMT, but anyway, 
The thing is, in Eternal Punishment, not only was that introduced so late in the game that it was almost pointless to have, but even higher level personas at that time didn't have buffs that affected all of your party members, only single targets, and they couldn't be stacked in any way, not even like the later games where you can make them last longer. In Nocturne, they use Matador to tell you very early on, Ayo, this is how you play the game, you better get used to it or else you're not getting very far, and I'm grateful for that. Now, I can't say I'm 100% a fan of this design choice, since that means limiting yourself on skill inheritance when fusing demons when there are skills I'd much rather have, but I'd prefer to be told about this in advance as opposed to way too late. And I can see why some people would think this adds an extra layer of strategy. I'd also recommend having someone with Dakaja as soon as possible to remove enemy buffs. A lot of the bosses in particular love to spam them. If there's one thing I'm really not a fan of compared to the use of buffs, it's the encounter rate. It is way too damn high at points. Not quite Persona 1 and 2 bad, but it's very close. You are given an indicator on the bottom right that changes color depending on how close you are to a battle, but god does the fighting get exhausting after a while. And just like Persona 1, you're not free of random encounters even in the overworld. Though luckily the enemies there are incredibly weak. This is probably a good time to mention how tricky it can be to find out where you're going in this game. I don't mean exploring the world map per se, since the buildings you can enter blink red to let you know, and the world map itself has plenty of barricades to stop you from getting lost, but this is a more old school RPG, meaning you have to run around and talk to people in specific places, or speak to your partner Hijiri in one of the save rooms for a vague hint of your next destination. Even with all of that, it's not always clear where you're supposed to be heading, and in conjunction with the high random encounter rate, it can be pretty frustrating too. I had to use a guide a lot of the time to quickly find out where the next dungeon takes place, and it was generally nice to have on the side to let me know how much health a boss is gonna have. Give me an idea of how close I am to beating it, you know? Because the scanning skill in this game sure as hell ain't gonna tell me. But I'd overall say I had a decent enough time with Nocturne, and it was a fairly good start to my Shin Megami Tensei experience. Though, again, this is coming from someone who's already played every Persona title, and personally I'm more into the pure power fantasy you get in those games, but I see some merits in Nocturne as well. I imagine this is one of those games you may need to replay to fully respect it, both for its story and philosophical messages as well as the gameplay. It's a little rough around the edges for first-timers like myself, but I can still play the game fine, and it's at least made me curious enough to try out some of the other ST games. Nocturne has some cool ideas going for it, like the dialogue options affecting the ending based on your morality, and the press turn combat system is very unique. My overall time came to 45 hours with the Labyrinth of Amala completed as well, which is maybe a tad too long for my liking, especially since 85% of it was all battling. But thankfully, it's not a Persona Q situation where it was 15 to 30 hours too long with only slightly more story. The HD remaster is probably the best way to go these days for its few quality of life improvements, but I'd say wait for a sale. It's not the best port as we discussed at the beginning of this video, but aside from emulating the PS2 original, it's probably the preferred way to play Nocturne. And if you're just trying out Shin Megami Tensei for the first time as well, let me know what you think of Nocturne in the comments below. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed my first look at an SMT game, and in case you're wondering if I'm going to be doing an SMT marathon anytime soon, I'm afraid I currently don't have plans for it. Nocturne took more out of me than a lot of the Persona games did. Hopefully that won't be the case with every SMT title. Now, if my subscriber count were to increase more, let's say up to 15,000, I might consider doing a marathon then. Hmm... As of now, I'd say the next time we're looking at SMT will be when the fifth mainline game comes out in November. I'm actually really looking forward to playing that. But for the next couple of videos, we're returning to Fire Emblem with Radiant Dawn for the Wii and Fire Emblem Awakening for the 3DS. With all said and done, thanks very much for watching, stay safe, stay healthy, and take care of yourselves. Thanks to the recent re-release of the third mainline entry for Mur uh, my I am actually looking forward to that playing... Ugh. As of now, I'd say the next time we're looking at SMT when... Ugh. Thanks very much for watching. You guys take care of yourselves. Say, hey, say, 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 say